Welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we bring you the musician story, and you've heard the music, now hear their story, and you've definitely heard my next guest's music. He's one of my favorite drummers from one of my favorite bands of the 90s and beyond, and he's written a new book telling the tale from the drummer's seat. Finally, a book from the drummer's seat. Uh, <laughs> the new book is called Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows, co-written with Steve Hyden. Please welcome to the show, Steve Gorman. Hey, man. Hey, Thanks Steve. for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, if folks are watching in the live feed, get your questions in for Steve. Tell us where you're watching from in the world, as well as in the replay, or if you're driving or flying, listening to the podcast version. This is just going to be a lot of fun today. Let's start with the book. I was just telling you, Steve, you hit it out of the park with this book. I, I couldn't put it down. Very cool. What inspired you to write this book now? Um, you know, I, it's, I, I think the simplest way to say it is, a, a, you know, I've known since 2014, the black crows were, were done and, and, and at least my involvement in the black crows and, and, um, you know, when the band blew up in 2014, that, that was never going to sit right. Uh, as far as how that happened. Um, uh, I definitely wasn't crazy about the way that the story was spun. Um, but all said, I, I was, I was for a few years after that, I was very busy with with Trigger Hippie, with my radio show at that time, Steve Gorman Sports. I have a family. I have all these things that are keeping me going. Um, and then in November of 16, almost three years ago, Ed Harsh died. And when he died, it was a, I, you know, I thought I had already gone as far as I could go with the sense of, of finality where the Black Crows are. The whole story of the band was done long since done it sat it made sense to me i didn't wasn't crazy about it it's a very sad story in my opinion but i understood it um and then ed's death brought a surprising new sense of finality if you will like as far as when everyone says the final nail in the coffin well ed ed you know moving on to the next realm was definitely that and it wasn't a conscious thought of it's time to write a book now but at the time i did write a eulogy for ed on my radio show i did a I opened my show that night with about a 12 minute, you know, segment about it. I mean, it was essentially my eulogy. And when, as I was writing it that day, it, it made sense to me to, to, I, I wrote way more than I needed. I had a lot to say. And then over the next few months following that, it kind of occurred to me, I had this needling thing. And one day I finally went, Oh, I think I want to write a book now, you know, but it, it just took, I was like the last guy to probably put that together. But that's what led to it. And then I just started and I thought, well, I'll write and see if I stop. And the more I started writing, the more I kept writing. And it was pretty obvious within a few weeks, like, oh, I think I'm actually going to do this. Hmm. You know, I, I was really struck by, I mean, there's some amazing laugh out loud moments. There's some deeply personal uh, moments in this. And I wondered for you, you, you know, you, I thought you were pretty brave talking about uh, issues around some of the conflicts in the band, mental health issues, addiction issues. What was it like for you emotionally going back through some of these stories and writing them? Um, a few times it, it was very difficult. You know, I, the way my memory works, it's pretty linear. I mean, I have a really a strong uh, attention to detail, I guess, that doesn't seem to strike me in real time, but it's all back in the back of my head somewhere. And there were a few moments it the stuff that was the hardest to write were the few things that I had never really dealt with. Uh, person, well, for instance, there's a, there's a chapter about Sven and some of the problems he had. That was far and away the hardest thing for me to write. And I think the reason is when when Sven and I reconnected in the band a few years after that fact, we never really talked about it. We didn't have to. Our relationship's solid. We like and respect each other. And he was in a good place, and I was just thrilled to see that he was in a good place. And we just got on with it. Um, and as I was writing it, I, I think I became aware of the fact that, wow, he and I never really went over this, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and it, was, it was at the time, you know, it, there was a sadness and a, and, a, and a devastating impact on me, which went beyond the Black Crows. It went back to the fact that Sven was the guy that I moved to Atlanta to start a band with and he and another friend, Clint, you know, it, it struck me in that regard. And it brought up a level of sadness about those guys and that original concept that I hadn't thought about in years uh, when I was writing it. Cause when I'm writing these stories, 
I mean, I know what everyone's wearing. I can remember what the room smelled like. I know what everybody was eating or drinking or whatever. And so it's, it is a pretty all, it's, it's all inclusive, you know, all of it comes back. And so while you know, I can't say any of it was fun, I really did enjoy the process. I got a lot out of it. Um, the cathartic thing for me was on a more linear, in a linear way. I, I'd already dealt with, I think, 90% of the emotional stuff already. I'd already, you know, I've been in therapy and I've been doing a lot of self-examination and I've looked at myself primarily as, well, what did I do to bring this on? How did I handle it? What can I do better? My main point in life is just trying not to repeat mistakes. I'm still making them and I will, but I just don't want to repeat them. I did a lot of repeating of mistakes when I was a young man in this band. So the, the, the best thing I got from the book was just the, that sense of this couldn't have gone any other way. I mean, this is literally, this was how it was going to be. Right. And it's real clear to me now. And just having a, 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 a document of it, a record of it written out, uh, was helpful in that regard. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about Ed as well? And, you know, your tribute to some, some of the laugh out loud moments yeah. involved Ed and with Sting walking by. I just, my wife was like, what are you laughing about? I couldn't stop right. laughing. It was great. Ed was a, Ed was a one in a billion guy, you know? And I mean, his, you know, I, I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the music in very specific terms just because I don't like to, I, you know, that's, just words get in the way, you know, it's like, listen to it. You know, you, you dig it or you don't, yeah. you pick up on things or you don't. I, you know, and within the band ourselves, we probably all had different ideas of when we were at our best or when we were at our most, uh, ambitious, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but with Ed, he, he was two things. He was largely responsible. He was the single biggest, single greatest teacher we ever had. I mean, we all just had to catch up to him. Mm. He showed us what it is to just, be that level of a musician. Um, so individually and collectively, when he joined the band, the whole thing, it was like, it was like throwing a match on a lit on a, you know, bunch of Tinder that was ready to go. And then, but then on top of all that, with his many issues and, and his addictions and the things that were holding him, you could say down personally, it all came out into playing, but it never got in the way of his enormous heart. I mean, he was just, he was hilariously funny. He had a great, interesting, unique sense of humor. He shared it with everybody. He had time for anybody. He, he was never a bad dude. You know what I mean? He always was a super friendly, uh, very, very hospitable guy. Not that he had a whole lot that most people wanted that he could offer, right. you know, I mean, he wasn't, he's not the general, he's not the average guy down walking down the street, but, uh, but in his own way, he was, he was so special and, and did bring so much humor to things sometimes you know quite unintentionally but still it was always there with him right an incredible musician something like descending is such a, a incredible example of that right mm -hmm. his his musicianship oh yeah no he was he was on a whole different level than we were when he joined the band yeah and you were just an 18 you were just a young kid when you moved to atlanta yeah i was you know, 21 you were 21 so, you know, one of the things I wanted to know a little bit more about was this dream of playing in a rock band. Uh, what inspired this dream? That it's the only well, it just goes back to, you know, when I was a kid and, and listening to albums religiously. I got a I got a Bee Gees album when I was six yeah. as a door prize at my brother's community college basketball game. Yeah. And I took it home and I wore it out Um and I'm the youngest of eight kids, so there was a lot of records in the house already. So yeah. I had a lot of things to choose from. So, uh, but but after just playing the, this Bee Gees album two years on obsessively, one of my brothers uh, came down and said, "Hey, here, take these." And he handed me down three Beatles albums. Mm -hmm. So when I was in 1971, he gave me "Meet the Beatles," "Help," and "Rubber Soul," mm -hmm. and I put on "Help" first. And and from literally the second ticket to ride kicked in, I just started air drumming. I didn't even know what I was doing. It just, it just washed over me and, and it never stopped. I, I was one of the world's great air drummers from that moment on and, um, and wanted to play drums and always imagined I would and, and just truthfully never got around to it. I mean, in a, uh, when I was 10, we moved to a really small town in Kentucky and I didn't have a lot of friends that were in the records the way I was. Um, and I was, you know, I was, in high school, I played soccer and basketball and I went to a small school and I had a lot of friends and I was totally cool. But, but my refuge was to go to the basement and just listen to records. That's where I was just in my own head. 
And um, it's it's there was nothing else I actually wanted to do. Like even by the time I got to college, I was thinking, well, I could probably be a broadcaster. I like sports. I think I could be a sportscaster. But at any given time, if anybody said, oh, what do you want to do? My answer was always simply, I want to be a drummer in a rock and roll band. That was it. Um, and when I would go see bands and when I started seeing bands in clubs, especially like by the time I was 17, 18 and I started going into clubs in Nashville to see bands, I just watched the drummer. I focused on the drummer. I tried to read how much they were moving the rest of the band around. You know, I right away would judge the drummer's in charge or he's flailing. You know, I was all who's running the band type of thing. And, you know, in, um, in soccer, I played sweeper and I did see my, I did always look at the sweeper as the drummer of the band. You know, you're, you're keeping everything in, in order. You're, 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 you're in charge, but not many people notice it. You know what I mean? Right. And that always made perfect sense to me. And so did I read it right that you never played until you got to Atlanta? Um, no, no lessons, no teachers, no. No, I played, I played, um, I mean, I played a handful of parties in college. I, I, one of uh, my brother, Dave and I, he was in school. He's four years older than me. And when I got to up to Bowling Green to start college at Western Kentucky, he was still in town and he said, Hey, well, you can play drums. Cause I, everyone knew I liked drumming and, but I hadn't played. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll fake it. You know? Yeah. Like I had, well, I think when I was a senior in high school, I sat at a drum kit for the first time and just started playing just to prove to myself I could do it. Yeah. And I could, I just started playing a straight beat and I knew what my feet were supposed to do. And I knew what the hands did, you know? And so when I got to college, um, he said, Hey, let's play this new year's Eve party. Cause he knew a guitar player and he knew a bass player. And he said, look, I'll sing you drum. We'll fake it. The rest of the guys will make sense. You know, the rest of the guys know what they're doing and that's where it started. So, um, I, you know, I did just that. I borrowed a kit from a friend and we learned 12 songs, you know, a couple of Beatles songs, Ramon songs, a Clash song. And we just played them all three or four times over the course of a New Year's Eve party. And that was it, you know, and then and that. But to me, I said, OK, I'm ready. Now I'm, that's it. I've played a party. I am ready to go. And I was the only one of that group that agreed that we were ready to for the big time. Um, and, oh. and as it turned out, we played the same party a year later. And then we played the same party a year after that. So in the span of three New Year's Eves over, you know, that's a two year period. I played three parties. And after the third one, I said, all right, that's it. I'm really going to do this. And so I found some other guys and basically did the same thing back up in Bowling Green. We would just have a band together. We'd learn a bunch of covers. And again, I'd never practiced in between. I mean, I literally played once a year, right. but I played the same thing on every song. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I think we played ZZ Top's LaGrange and I played the exact same beat as you can't do that by the Beatles. I didn't care. I was just playing. <laughs> and, um, but after that third party moving into 86, you know, we put together, um, uh, some other friends of mine, my brother had left. I just found some other guys and we were playing parties at Western Kentucky university on occasion, just at this one rugby house where these rugby players live, but they'd have us and we changed our name every time. It's hard to build a following, but it's more fun that way. <clears throat> and so I'd literally played, I'd say probably a dozen times spent at a drum kit actually doing anything when I decided to drop out and move to Atlanta and do it for real. Wow. So that was pretty brave courageous or, or whatever you want to call it, but 21 and, and in your book, you basically say three months later or so you're in the studio with Mr. Crow's garden, which would yeah. become the black crows. That's right. What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was terrifying. I mean, I, I didn't question, you know, when I first got to town and started playing, you know, I bought my first kit when I got to Atlanta and I, you know, I, I remember so clearly setting it up the first day at the house and the other guys in my band, which were Sven Pippian and my buddy Clint, you know, they looked at me like, yeah, let, let's hear something. And I was, I didn't want to sit down and start playing. You know, I was like, oh, they're going to be, they're going to figure out, I don't know what I'm doing. It's right. going to be, this is not going to be good. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, slowly but surely, you know, they, they plugged in and they started working on a song and I just like, okay, I'll just be the metronome here. And, right. you know, it took me a while to get past the fear of that. I didn't care what anyone else thought. I didn't want them to think, what right. have we done? You know? Sure. sure. Um, but it, but I got past that pretty quickly. And I mean, I was always very confident. Um, some of that's delusional and some of that's just inherently knowing, well, I'm, I'm good at this. You know, right. I'm supposed to, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. I was always supposed to do this. I'm just the idiot that waited till now. So, um, you know, and within that, I, I, my greatest strength 
turned out to be my greatest weakness, which is I didn't have many arrows in the quiver. You know what I mean? I didn't have a lot of fills. I didn't have a lot of rudiments. I could just play really straight and really strong. Yep. And, you know, for a young band, that, that's about the best possible thing you could ask of the drummer because right. everybody's trying to figure out what they're doing. Right. And usually if you add a drummer who's trying to be Keith Moon to the mix, you just have a you just have a grease fire. And right. so the good thing about my first band, Mary My Hope, and then when I joined Mr. Crow's Garden is no one had to worry about me getting in the way. I was just every song was as straight and as simple as I could make it. Well, and it's all about the groove anyway. Who, who yeah. you mentioned the Beatles, obviously Ringo, uh, who you recently just got to play with, by the way. Yeah. I, w- I want to check in about that too. Right. But who, who were your main inspirations drumming wise? R- Ringo's everything. I mean, that was the guy that, you know, I mean, and I have a lot of drummers I loved, but Ringo is where it started. And, 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 and I loved Ringo so much that it was years before I realized that oddly enough, Joe English was also a huge influential drummer because I've, I, as I was then accumulating, I got all the Beatles albums, and as I was getting all the solo albums, uh, Wings Over America, when I, when I got that, when that came out, Joe English is incredible on that album. And I listened to that album so much that in, I think it was 1993, we were in Portland, Maine, the Black Crows were out, we were touring on our second album, and I walked into a used record store, and they had a CD of Wings Over America for like 10 bucks, and I bought it, and I was like, man, I haven't heard this in forever. And I got on the bus that night and I put it on and I just right away, I was like, oh, my God, this is these are all my fills. I was like, (laughs) everything I do is from Wings Over America. You know, like, holy shit. I I didn't dawn on me that Joe English had stamped my brain so hard, but he very much had. Um, But but, you know, but along the way I had when I got out, when I left the Beatles as my primary musical inspiration, it was for new wave bands. That was the first thing that really broke through. And I love that first Devo album, and those drums are crazy. Um, you know, I I, lo- I love the first Blondie record because I loved Clem Burke's playing. Um, you know, there there were things like the Knack album. That guy in the Knack was yeah. spectacular. Absolutely. Uh, Bruce Gary is that his name? He was incredible. Yes. Um, and so there was a bunch of stuff along the way, but again, I wasn't playing when I was listening to all these records. I was just thinking about it. And they were all it was all just going into the the part of my brain that held all these things. And I all the drummers I just named, I really dig, but all of them were responsible for the well, you know, to me drumming's it's all feel. That's all that matters. It's how does the band feel playing around you? And how do you make everybody else's day easier? You know, it's a really in the you know, it's a it's a facilitator more than anything else. You're giving everyone else a deep gr- a pocket with enough movement in it to give them space to find themselves. You know, like if I sit down in a session, if I'm playing with a bass player for the first time, um, you know, I'm I, I, all I'm thinking about is, well, I don't know where his sense of I don't know where his one is intrinsically, mm-hmm. you know, I know where mine is. I got I got a I got a swing when I play that I'm not trying. It's just how I play. And it's going to be up to that guy to find out where he fits in with me because I can't really do anything else. I do my thing. Yeah. And and that tends to work. I, I, I have a lot of different bass players that will go, man, I love playing with you. And they don't play anything I like. Yeah. And that's a testament to my malleability and to the fact that I never really consciously had a vision for what I was going to do. I just do what I do. Um, and again, that's another thing that's a strength and a weakness to, you know, you have to know how to use that. Sure. There are certain bands there. There's a lot of rock bands that I would be a terrible fit for, yeah. you know, because they need something really, really rigid. You know, Bruce Springsteen needs, he just needs a jackhammer in Max Weinberg. And I, you know, I would be a terrible drummer for that band. You know what I mean? That's just not how I play. Um, I could play all those parts. I could play, I can play a lot of stuff, but as far as what I'm naturally doing, It's and I think I think all my favorite drummers have their own meter in their head. You know, it's their own connecting point. I always said I never really listened to Led Zeppelin until I got to Atlanta. When I bought a drum kit, that's when I dug into Zeppelin. Mm. And right away, I felt such a connection to all those. I'd heard those songs a million times. It was I grew up in the 70s and 80s. You couldn't get away from Led Zeppelin. But I'd never owned a Zeppelin album. and I'd never sat there with headphones and I'd never just lost hours of my life to Led Zeppelin. And when I first did that, I had just bought a kit. And while I couldn't play those parts, they made perfect sense to me. I mean, I really felt connected to them in a way that I felt connected to Ringo. It was like, and it's only because of the swing and the bounce. And I I heard like a sense of humor in a lot of what Bonham played. That sounds weird, but 
I just some of the stuff he's doing, it just made me smile. It was like it's just funny. I, I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah, exactly. um, a, a supercharged level of humanity in his playing right. um, that I always just connected with. So um, I don't even know what the question was, That's but so you know, good, man. but You're... all of these things went into the the stew that is my brain. Oh, well, you said so. We're doing a session the very first time with a guy who had produced a lot of records and knew exactly what he's doing, and and I. I was a little insecure about my playing, but at the same time, I had no problem going right up to the guy. His name was Steve Gronbeck. And I said, hey, man, I have no idea what I'm doing. Just don't even <laughs> let you know, before you figure this out. Let me tell you, I've only been playing for a minute. And, uh, and uh, naturally, I was intimidated by a studio and he was great. He said, don't worry about it. You just you just got to find a pocket. And I, and I literally looked at him. I said, and that pocket is what exactly? You know, I just didn't, you define, didn't get yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> and he just said, no, just find a groove. You know, just we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. And we did. You know, I, I, that first session, um, it was for one song. It was a demo for A&M Records, you know, and I'm sitting there and go, and I'd had my kit for three months and, uh, and I wasn't in the band yet. So that actually helped. I wasn't thinking I would. I thought this, I'm helping my friends out. They asked me to do this. They needed a drummer, and I know how to play this one song. No big deal. Um, but that's the session that led to them saying, hey, why don't you join our band? And one thing led to another. The book is called Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows. We're talking with Steve Gorman today. You know, there's a lot of highs and a lot of lows in this band, Steve, that you wrote about. And I you know, yep. felt, felt like a fly on the wall. Um, Let's go a couple of the highs first. You were talking about Zeppelin meeting Robert Plant and getting to play mm -hmm. with Jimmy Page. Tell me about that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, I, 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 a lot of things I write about in the book are, are extraordinary and normal at the same time when you're living that life and you're on tour. When we first met Robert Plant, we'd been on the road for six months already. We had already toured with Aerosmith. We had done a tour with Hart. Uh, we, so, you know, we were doing arenas as an opening act. That was starting to settle in and make sense to us. But then when we met Robert, he was immediately so welcoming and gracious and funny and cool and everything about him was great. And I could sit there, I, I could hold in my hand. I'm having a conversation with this guy, and it's fascinating because he's talking about some off the beaten path restaurant he found on the way here today. And it's just a guy telling you a story right. and then he gets up and leaves. And then as the, after he leaves, you think, and that was Robert plant. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole lot of, uh, I can't believe this is happening and it makes perfect sense that it's happening at the same time. That's how an awful lot of my stuff. Um, a lot of my experiences felt, you know, and meeting Jimmy Page and then playing with Page, it was always that way. When we're in the room to get, when we're doing what we're doing, you're just focused. I mean, we're just doing what we're here to do. And he dug what we did. I obviously loved what he was doing. It's all good. But there were, there were many nights where, you know, the gig's over. It was great. We had a laugh. We all had a few drinks. And then I get back to the hotel room and I sit there and go, what the fuck just happened? What was that? You know, so it was great. And I, I, um, I, I always had the ability. I didn't have to pretend it wasn't super cool. I didn't have any problem admitting, you know, the way I look at it, you know, Paige is one of my uh, iconic figures. Like when I discovered Zeppelin, that was, you know, I, 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 I was just learning to play. I was just in a band for the first time. And the Beatles got me there. The Beatles and then REM actually see becoming an REM fan in high school when their first EP came out and then following them obsessively through the, through the few years, you know, you can be a Beatles fan, but you still don't necessarily think I have to go do that because how the hell do you do that? Right. Right. Well, you walk into a club and this band called REM, no one's ever heard of is playing and you dig it. You can go, Oh, well I can see that. Like right. it's literally, Oh, that door is right there. Like, I don't know how you get to Ed Sullivan and I don't know how you get to the Hollywood bowl <laughs> and I don't know how you make Abbey road, but I can go play in a shitty club on a Tuesday night, right. you know, which is, <laughs> Sounds so obvious, but you need those moments to make you realize, oh, this is how it starts. Right. And so I did that. Um, and and along the way, though, I never lost my reverence for my the people that I love and respect. I mean, like, I, you know, when we're playing with Jimmy Page, we're peers. I mean, he's looking at me. I'm just the drummer right. and he's the guitarist. Yeah. 
Um, and I, I, it's not arrogance. It's just reality. That's where we were. Right. But I, I never had a problem saying at that time, like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, it never dawned on me to even have this as a dream. Everybody said, oh, it must have been a dream come true. And what I always said was, well, if it had occurred to me, yeah. Right. It didn't dawn on me to sure. dream that this was going to happen. <laughs> you know. And, you know, uh, reading about your your friendship together, you and Jimmy, your kinship, and there was a, a hilarious, sweet, and, and surreal story that you talk about in the book of right. taking a nap with Jimmy Page. <laughs> yeah. It's the, well, again, like, you know, he that's a that's a testament more than anything to the entire experience he let his guard down completely he knew that he could trust us not i mean just just and that's not something you think about consciously and i'm talking about jimmy page as a guy who at that time he'd been jimmy page for 30 years that means there's a giant wall that has to be placed around him in every situation because because i can only imagine the craziness that comes at him from all directions at all times. And, and he, he enjoyed playing with us. We all got along really well. And I think he, he was just very comfortable in that setting with us. And it was pretty apparent, um, you know, that that was rare for him. I think, I think we all were aware of the fact that this was special to him for a lot of those reasons. And again, I don't think he's consciously thinking that this is me with 20 years hindsight too, but Right. It, it it's pretty clear to see. So that was just a really, cause it was a very organic naturally. It fell into place. It was great. We were all having a blast and uh, you know, nobody overthought it. It was just, it just worked out really nicely. So, you know, but there were moments like that. There's plenty of stuff that I wouldn't think to share, you know, that, that were very per, you know, you have conversations and True. it's like, wow, that, that means the world to me, or that's hilarious. Or I can't believe I just heard that. That's not for anybody's, he there's things he would say to anybody. There's a lot of that throughout the whole thing, you know, but 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 the few things that I did share in the book always meant a lot for that very reason. You know, they're just so unexpected and so funny. And, and that's just what they were. Right. And, you know, I'm sure it was more obviously for you, but I was sitting there when it ended reading it and just feeling bummed out about it, that it yeah. ended so abruptly. Well, I, I, it was it, I, it bummed me out that it ended, you know. It's also the guy's back is totally screwed up. Okay, okay, fine. Sure. When I found out there another element to that later, it was it was incredibly. You know, I was furious, and and I'm I'm writing the book as to my mindset at the time, yeah. not in 2019 sitting here, but I was really angry about it, and I was and I was what I was angry about was just there's just elements that that you see throughout the book, which is. The absurdity of of not understanding the moment when it's actually happening. That was something that that my bandmates were pretty bad at. Not seeing where we were and why we were where we were and acknowledging it and just letting things sit. You know, like there was always this, you know, they're the kind of guys that, they, it, it, well, I'm going to speak figuratively. You know people that can't ever leave a moment of silence. They have to fill it with with words mm -hmm. for no reason other than they don't know how to be quiet. And that's what being in the Black Crows kind of felt like, you know, when things were going perfectly well, it's like, just take a look at this and just fuck it. Let's just not ruin it. Let, let's not mess it up. Right. We don't have to do anything. It's always like, you don't have to be smart. You just don't have, you just got to not be stupid. Right. And we struggled with a lot of those things. And that whole situation was one of those, you know, um, uh, uh, it, the idea that, um, you know, not seeing the trees for the forest and, and the conversation he had with Rich that that he told me about a year and a half later was just this ultimate example of how can you misread the world around you so deeply mm. and it's not you know jimmy was 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 gracious and accommodating and he was offering a lot more and i have no issue with somebody thinking i don't know if i want to do that or not the idea that you would just flat out say no to somebody he's not jimmy page of led zeppelin at that moment he's jimmy page the guy that we're having a great time with who, because he's playing with us, it's literally presented our band with this amazing opportunity. We had not created otherwise. We were actually, you know, on life support and suddenly we're strong again, all thanks to our association with Jimmy. Right. And then he extends himself and you say, no, thanks. It's a very, 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 that's a tough thing to get my head around. I don't understand how you can you know, how is that even a possibility that that would be the answer? So that's that's where all that came from. It's not just, you know, 
And again, 20 years later, that part still is there. It's like, wow, that's a that's a shocker. I mean, I'm long since over the tour being canceled. That's 20 years ago. You know, I went home. That tour was canceled, and I had a three-week-old baby at home. And, and the next day, I was back home with him. Trust me. I was like, okay, right, cool. Right. Um, would have been great, and I was having a great time. But I, I can, you know, I, I, one thing I learned from this band is I can handle just about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's, the, it's, it's, it's the stuff that, that would grind my gears was just how unnecessary so much of the drama was and how our only uh, – all of our weaknesses were all of our mortal wounds were self-imposed always. Can we talk a little bit more about that? I mean, you were very open and honest and explicit with some of the conflicts in the band, interpersonal issues, mental health and addiction, your own struggles, like you talked sure. about in Japan, the struggles with the brothers Robinson and the, the rest mm -hmm. of the band. Can we talk about what, what sort of lessons have you been learning <laughs> from all of this? Well, you know, there's there's a lot to be said, both good and bad, for being the kind of person that says, "Oh, let me help. I can, I can, you know, let, let me, let me, let me take care of this. I got, I'll, I'll do it." You know, taking on more than you actually are equipped to take on. Um, you know, I, I'm all about go team. You know, it's like, hey, jump on. You know, in my mind, we were a basketball team, and I was happy to play defense and rebound. You know, I didn't need to dunk ever. I was just, you know. Um, not everybody sees the world. That, it took me a really long time to accept the very simple fact that everybody looks at this band very differently. I, I had this assumption, and, and it's easier to do as a local band. Well, we're all on the same page. We're all showing up to rehearse. We're all playing gigs. We all want the same things. And then as the bands, you know, as, the, as it took off with the first album, and once there was all these external elements, it was – it's – plain as day that that we were not on the same page that everybody saw the band differently everybody wanted different things but i couldn't accept that for you know the first five six years of the band's existence i just could not get my head around that um and the biggest problem i had was just simply admitting that i was struggling i mean I, how can i be struggling i'm i got this together i'm smart and i know who i am and this is this is not my problem and you know, that's the worst possible way to go into anything, you know, like everybody. Now, there was also a fear of of, of, of expressing vulnerability because you'd get killed in the Black Crows. Right. Everybody had their own battles to fight internally. And I only really speak to mine because that's the only one I really have an understanding of. But, you know, but I, I, I had um, just like the band, you know, I had great strengths and I had great weaknesses. And, and a lot of times they look very similar and it's just a matter of a conversation going a little too far around the bend before I could recognize one, you know, am I, am I the strong person here or am I the weak link? And they can be, it can be really confusing and, and familiarity, uh, in, in a, in a family with addiction, in a band with addiction, any situation that has addiction is in there in, invariably going to have codependency. You get this mix of people who all are in the room together and, and as, toxic as it can be, it becomes very familiar. And then that works its way into your brain as, as being comfortable. There's a difference between familiar and comfortable. Right. And when you lose sight of that difference, which everybody in our world did pretty early on, you're just kind of a clown car at that point. I mean, you know, you, you have your great moments. We could still make great music, right. but the way we interacted, the way we dealt with each other, the way we dealt with our band as a, you know, our career, the way we handled pretty much everything became, um, you know, it, it was inefficient, ineffective. It was negative and it was very tense and difficult. Yeah. You know, and I was also struck by uh, your your manager at the time, who basically who was your Peter Grant uh, of the Black Crows, Pete Angelus. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Pete Angelus gave you a real gift as far as recommending a book of, of real mm -hmm. self-awareness at some point yeah. uh, that you we, chose we, to take. Yeah. And we talked a lot about, you know, that I mentioned that in the book, that was hardly the first time we'd had a conversation about what was going on. And there were conversations very early on about alcoholism and addiction and what that looks like and what it does to the people around who care. But, you know, it's a hard thing to look at someone you've decided you're going to love and support and always have his back and go, he's an addict. That that was very hard for me to do. It was very hard for a lot of people to do. Um, 
no matter what they do, because then you say, well, what does that say about me that I'm just here? I mean, none of this is conscious linear thought at the time when you're in your 20s and everything you ever wanted is happening. It's just all blowing up and, and there's all these things. But like I said, before you know it, familiarity gives way to comfort, gives way to this is just who we are. This is how we are. There's nothing I can do about it. And I was drinking like a fish for the first part of the, you know, by the time we hit 94, 95 and things were getting really, really, really traumatic for everybody, I was drinking just to stay, keep my head together. And I never went back to the depths that I had hit in Japan in 1992. But my way of not doing that was to just shut down and check out and not allow myself to feel so much. So I had all kinds of issues myself, you know? Um, and, and I think that Pete, we, I talked with Pete a lot over the years. There, there were several really big conversations that, that, that ultimately they all added up to me finally just accepting a lot of things. There's an entire, I had a, I had a, a really, I, I basically in Japan, I hit a wall. I write about this in a book. I would say for lack of a better term, I pretty much had a nervous breakdown. Oh, I had another one in 1998 that didn't make the final edit. That one really wasn't about the Black Crows at all. That was about everything else that I had put away to just deal with being in the Black Crows. It was, you know, by that point, I was 33. And I think most people, by the time they're 33, they've been on their own. I mean, a lot of people anyway. They've had an opportunity to look at their own life and their own perspective and view it through their own lens. And I was at a place where I was like, I, I got to make sense of things from my childhood. I need to make sense of things from from, you know, I I was married and I'm looking at my wife at times and she, we're just not even connecting because I can't express myself in a linear fashion anymore. There was a lot going on. And when I really kind of unwound in 1998, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I, I really let everything go and, and, and recognized, okay, the, the black crows is what I do. It's not who I am. If, if, and I, I realized, I was like, if, I, if, if the Black Crows is who I am, I need to go jump off a bridge right now because this band is not going to last forever. I have to know that there's something beyond this band. And, and then it's, and, but it's embarrassing to admit that to people when you're supposedly the voice of reason and you're the logical one and I'm just as obsessed and, and, and mindlessly committed to this thing and I'm going against my own gut instinct, a lot, you know, and when I talk about not making mistakes for the, you know, not repeating mistakes, I'll make mistakes. What I won't do again is things that I know very clearly I shouldn't do. I, I, you know, my, my lowest points when I look back as a member of the black crows were the moments when I gave in against my own better judgment. You know, the better angels of my nature were singing loud and clear. And I ran out of the energy to support myself and said, fine, whatever. And those are the ones those are the things that you wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, fuck, you know, I mean, making an earnest, honest effort and screwing up. Well, whatever. Right. right. That, that, that's that's normal. Right. That's healthy if you're smart enough to admit it. Um, and for a long time, I wasn't smart enough to admit those things. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think it's fantastic. Obviously, I love the music. I love your drumming, but it's fantastic to hear the work you've been doing, the self-awareness. Before we move on to other things, because you, you're a busy guy, you got a lot of projects, and I want to take some questions from the folks who are watching as well. Um, you, if I read correctly in the book, you haven't spoken to Chris or Rich in quite a while since the, the band broke up. I, I haven't spoken to Chris since 2014. I haven't spoken to Rich since right after Ed passed. Um, and that was just a, it's just silly business. It, you know, we, we were very much in communication for the first two years after the band broke up. Okay. Um, uh, but we had a conversation where I was trying to get, I, I, you know, there, there was, there was some business things to attend to and he was holding back information from me that I was surprised to find out. I thought we had worked through that shit and that he at least understood the strategic value of staying aligned with me in Black Crow's business. And to to be very direct, he just lied to me about something that I already knew. And he, I gave him three opportunities to not do that. And he went three for three. And I said, well, you know what this means? We're done now. And I've never spoken to him since. Yeah. And, and uh, no reaching out on either side. If you were to talk to him, what would you say? 
Um, I don't, I don't, I, I haven't even thought about it. I, I don't know what the circumstance would be that would make me want to give him a call. Um, you know, and it's not, it's, it's not out of any reason other than there's no, my life is much better without the, either one of them in it. That's how I see it. I would imagine they probably say the same about me. It, okay. I mean, it's fine. You know, there's pretty much everybody that was ever in the band is all can see, you know, everybody, you know, I have a relationship with just about everybody, anybody I was ever close with, I'm still close with. Yeah. Um, Everybody has their own varying degree of relationship with the Robinson brothers. They're very unique. They, they do, you know, I see them as the same person with very different surface, you know, they're different on the surface. They're very much alike beyond that. And, you know, they're, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, not an unusual thing. Um, I would hardly be the only guy to say what I'm saying now, which is I deal with everybody, but them. Yeah, and sometimes just like uh, ex-girlfriends, relationships are best left uh, left alone, right, and not not turned yeah, over. Yeah, so. there's there's like when I say this, it's not out of anything. There's nothing to say. It's it's all been said. It's been all said. it was all said a long time ago. All been said. And so yeah. the other thing I was curious about because I'm a sports fan as well is you go from the Black Crows. Tell me if I've got the the chron- chronology correct, and you you uh, open up your own sports radio show. How did that happen? Yeah, that started, well, it started very much in the, well, still in the band. I started doing that locally here in Nashville in 2008 or nine um, on weekends. You know, it, it's a, it, it was, um, I had a notion when I started listening to sports talk radio, I had this weird idea that, well, I thought, well, you know, I could do that, but I heard a unique sort of spin on that and living in Nashville, Tennessee, Simply put, I went in and, and I guessed it on an afternoon show a few times. A buddy, I met a guy and he did the afternoon sports talk show in town. And he said, oh, you should come in. So I did a few hours uh, with him. And the program director said, man, you should come back every week. You're really good. I could I could get a sponsor for your segment. Wow. And I said, actually, I'd just rather have my own show. And <laughs> yeah, hey, why not? Go home, you know? right? <laughs> yeah. And he looked at me, he goes, well, what is it? And I said, it's musicians talking sports. I mean, that's all I said. And he said... Oh, okay. Let's get let's get lunch and talk about it. And two weeks later, I was on the air. You know, it's like in in a town like Nashville, that's not a crazy concept. You know, there's everybody's a musician, and um and there's a real connection between the Titans and the Predators and the local music scene. Those those connections were all made for marketing purposes, but very organically and naturally too. Who is your team? And so so I was doing that locally, and yeah. then um and then when the Black Crows went on tour, I started doing that just sporadically. When the band took off 2011 and 2012, I picked up a daily show. And so I did it. I started in this fall of 2011, five days a week. And then I did it all through 12. And it was successful here locally. And then in early 13, the Black Crows started their last tour. And I was still doing it from the road the first few months. I would go find a studio every morning and get up wherever I was and connect back in and do my show. Wow. And so that tour ran. So I stopped that summer, though. It just became too much. We were going to go to Europe for a month, et cetera, et cetera. I got home. Um, er, well, early on in the tour, I should say, I got a call from the guy that was the head of Fox Sports Radio. And he had heard the show and he got in touch and he said, is this a hobby? Is this a career? Are you serious? What is this? And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I want to do this for real. And what I said was, I want to I said, the Crows are going to do a 25th anniversary tour in 2015. And I want to have my own bus that's wrapped with a sponsor and has a studio on the bus. And I want to do an afternoon talk show and then a gig at night. Great idea. Now, you know, I'm at a, that is Z and B through Y are a ton of flaming hoops for other people to figure out. I just told him what my vision was and he loved it. And he was a man, let's make that happen. And before I knew it, he was talking about hiring me at Fox sports radio and the tour ended in December. I got home like on the 20th and he called me, it was Christmas Eve and said, you want to go next month? Five days a week. And I said, sure. And I was way in over my head there, yeah. you know, uh, but hardly for the first time. And I thought, you know, that there's the line. If, if you're not in over your head, you never find out how tall you are. And I've been I'm a big fan of that one. Right. It's fantastic. And who who is your team right now that you're you're excited about? I'm not. I'm an Orioles fan. So there's nothing to talk about there. My, my NFL team is the Tennessee Titans. Okay. My soccer club is Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Um I, I, you know, I, my, I like the Predators. The hockey team in Nashville is pretty strong. Yeah. And I've been here 15 years, 
I didn't have a team before I got here, so I claimed them, and I've been there ever since, Great. Uh, just like I did with the Titans. So, yeah. um, you know, one I'm, I'm batting one for three. I'm a basketball fanatic, but I don't have a team. I like every. I just watch the league, and I appreciate. Um, I grew up a Lakers fan, and then by the mid '90s, I'd, I'd I'd let them go, and I just watch everybody now. That's awesome. That's great. So, you know, the other thing that you got going on, a couple of other things, you got Trigger Hippie and Steve Gorman Rocks that's coming up. I loved the first album, Trigger Hippie, Heartache on the Line, one of the most beautiful mm-hmm. songs I've ever heard. Thank uh, you. It was fantastic. You have some lineup changes with this mm-hmm. new album. Uh, tell us about the new Trigger Hippie album coming out. Uh, it's called Full Circle and Then Some. It's out on October 11th. And, um, you know, Nick, the bassist, Nick Govrick and I are the, we started this thing. We're the first guys who called it Trigger Hippie. And it's initially, it was all, it, Trigger Hippie was in its infancy. It was whoever showed up, you know, it was like the rhythm section's here. Yeah. Uh, if you got a guitar and if you want to sing a few, sh- you know, let's do something. And so it was very much a revolving door, a side project's side project. You know, it was the ultimate side project. But Nick is the primary songwriter. Like he wrote "Heartache on the Line." You know, he's he's written all of the 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 best songs of the band. And we always had a thing in our head of it'd be great if we could find the people that we you know make this an actual thing. Like this could be a real band. So the band, the group that made that first album, it felt that way, and it certainly was a cohesive unit. And we had some great live shows. And I like that first record. It was pretty apparent once it came out that we were the only guys actually looking at it like, let's turn this into a thing. And I think with that lineup, and and this is just a matter of chemistry and people's priorities. This is nothing to do personally with anybody. It was just not, that was not going to last. That was not built for that in mind. And it was not going to be something you could then convert into that. You know what I mean? It was like, if you, if you put together a rugby team, you're not going to teach them how to play football. You know, they're going to play rugby. Right. Simplest way to put it. So, that's what we did. And, and, and when that band ran aground, if you will, when it was obvious that not everybody wanted to commit time to it, that was fine. We just sort of Nick and I backed off and said, OK. Mm-hmm. And we took some time to say, well, what do we even want to do this? Like, should we be a band or do we? And, you know, Nick has got all these songs. And I was like, do you want to just make a record like I'll play on it and we'll produce it together? Or, you know, we we had a few conversations. But, you know, the truth is we always did want to have a band. We wanted to find people. And not, we don't want people, it was never, let's find people that get on our plate, but we just, it's that same, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with chemistry and teamwork and, and, and finding a group of people and, and then figuring out what the Venn diagram is within this group of people. And it doesn't have to be equal amounts of influence. It should just be a where everyone's happy with what you're doing and how you're doing it, whatever that means. If everyone's cool and everyone wants to go somewhere together, like that's what I see a band as let's go. And so we kind of had a loose idea of if this works, it'll be great, but we're not going to force it. I've in other projects, music and otherwise in life, I think everybody's done things where you, you push a little too hard. You, you, you do, you get a square peg and you try to stick it in that round hole and you do your best. And, and the whole time you ignored this thing in the back of your head saying, this isn't quite right, Right. but it's close to being right. So let's just see if we can make it right. That never works. It certainly didn't with the first trigger hippie. Uh, that we took out with an album. So this time it was uh, more a question of, as I get older, I get more patient, which is a little counterintuitive, uh, but it's true. It just helps to, like you said, you learn, you don't want to repeat mistakes and you just got to slow down. And um, if anything, we just said, well, if we find some people and we dig it and we're playing, we're not going to take a single step until we know we've got everything in, in, in order. And so, you know, long story short, that goes from my buddy Ed Jurdy in, I think, 2016 saying, if you're going to keep going, man, I'd, you know, I'd come jam with you. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, and so a couple few times that year, only two or three times we got together with Ed. But every time it was really productive, really efficient communicating with him. We just clicked. And it was so good that I just slowed it down even more. Cool. This is great. Let's just. When he's available and if, and if we're available, you know, like I said, I got a national daily sports show. Right. Nick runs two restaurants and Ed's in the Band of Heathens, which is a busy band. We're not going to when we all when it, when we connect, let's just see what happens. And it just kept going like that. And then by, you know, sometime in 2017, we were like, hey, let's 
let's do this. Let's go find out. Let's go figure out who else we need. And then, you know, eventually you get to a place. I mean, this album was pretty much in the can, you know, a year ago. Um, we had found Amber Woodhouse, our new singer, and we loved her. It was great. Everything clicked. Amazing voice. And then the, she's incredible. Yeah. And then, but, you know, saying you're just about done with the record, again, it was like, well, how do we want to put this out? Who do we want to work with? What do we actually want to do? And we took our sweet time figuring that out. I had a book that I had to finish writing. I've got this radio show that I just got off the ground about three weeks ago. I had a lot of things going on, as did everyone else, as does Ed and Nick and Amber. And, you know, it's just for a variety of reasons. I didn't think in my head it would make my original plan. The radio show we thought was going to be up by like May or June. It turned out it came on in September. That's only three months. But three months that that I thought would be well out of the way by the time the book was released. And then I thought, the you know, originally it looked like the album would be first, then the show, then the book. It just kept these three projects. I'm trying not to get them in each other's way. But at the same time, it just all and ended up being, well, there's going to be a one-month period where all three are hitting the ground. So right. here we right. go. And here we go. Right. So talk about the, the new radio show, Steve Gorman Rocks. Tell us about that, please. It's uh, it's with Westwood One Cumulus Network. Um, it's a, it's a, it's at night. You know, seven to twelve Eastern is is when we uh, air when the show airs live. It's um, some stations out west play it. They delay it. You know, obviously with time frames. But um, it's on. I think we're on about thirty three markets right now. And it's it's you know it's we're just in our first month. And it's classic rock. And it's. It's a show where, you know, I, I'm there to provide context for the music, tell stories, stories that, that involve me, that involve the bands we're hearing. It's I'm interviewing people. It's I mean, I'm very much the host of this show. I'm not the guy picking which 10 songs an hour we're going to play. Right. Um, I'm I have I, I do say, hey, I'd like to hear this tonight. Let's play a little extra Zeppelin. You know, September 25th, we played a lot of Zeppelin. I mean, sure. those things are kind of obvious. Right. But as a general rule. You know, classic rock format is a radio format where the listeners, everyone involved knows what they want to hear. There's just a and right now that sweet spot is like mid 70s to mid 80s. You know what I mean? With outliers moving up into the 90s. You know, there's we play Black Crows. We play Smashing Pumpkins and Pearl Jam. And, you know, there's a few of those songs. But the heart of the matter right now is is 75 to 85. Well, for me, that's 10 to 20 in my life. I was 10 to 20. Those are pretty impactful years in my life. And so. But the truth is, like I said earlier, I was a really new, I was a new wave kid. A lot of the music we play, and when it was out, I wasn't listening to. I wasn't a fan of, say, Journey or, mm-hmm. or some of the other ba- or Bob Seger. Right. These are songs that I discovered way later in life. You know, I listen to Seger now, and I just go, "Holy shit, right. what a song!" Right. You know, it's Crazy. like, oh, there's a reason that's on every night for 40 years. Right. You know, the and it, it is funny because the other night. You know, when I was in high school, I was the cool guy that liked all the bands no one heard of. I wore that like a badge of honor. And all my friends are going to see Journey and Loverboy and having a great time. And I'm at home listening to my English beat records like an idiot. You know what I mean? I mean, and I still love the records I love then. But, you know, a song like Lights comes on by Journey. And I'm just sitting there like, it's a good ass song. You know, it's like I was the worst at compartmentalizing my musical taste. You know, I mean, I loved ACDC and Van Halen back then, but I didn't want to admit it because I liked Devo instead, you know, <laughs> so the way, way too much. I'm sorry. This stuff was way too big a part of my identity. And, and, you know, and I missed a lot of good music along the way because of it. Right. But better late than never, though. Right. Sure. So absolutely. And and so that's on Westwood One. The new Trigger Hippie is out October 11th. Is that right? Yep. Awesome. Friday, October 11th. Very cool. Man, the the book is called Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows. We're talking with Steve Gorman. Let's get a couple of questions in from the folks who are watching. We've got Jack Keller. Let me see if I can bring Jack in here. Says he loves, hold on a minute, loves the Cabin Fever DVD. Mm -hmm. Um, Some memories about the time at Levon's studio. What do you remember now, good or bad, uh, Love Before the Frost Um, album? Yeah, I'm... It, it was as enjoyable a recording process as we ever had. I mean, just from how cool is it to say, yeah, we were in Levon Helm's barn for three right. three weeks, and and along the way we've had five nights with a live audience cutting brand new songs. I mean, that was just cool. It sounds good, and it really was good. The best 
The last night we played, Levon, they brought out a cocktail kit at the end of the night, and Levon sat in on a couple of blues numbers with us. Nice. You know, that's pretty special. He would be around during the day and then got, and, you know, we, we, we saw him enough. He was kind of steering clear, you know. I mean, we would, I was happy if he hung out the whole time, but, you know, we had a record to make. And, yeah. But we were writing those songs. You know, Monday through Thursday, we were just putting songs together. And then Friday and Saturday, or Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever the nights were, then we'd bring people in and play them. And, and we did, you know, we'd do two or three or four passes at a song and then move on. And we were telling, you know, we said to the audience, like, this may be a record, it might not. It's kind of just an experiment. You know, what if we got a live album out of this, of new material? Yeah. And it wasn't so much, uh, I, but, but there was an energy in the room, and we are a live band. The, the, the essence of the Black Crows, the magic of the Black Crows was the band playing together live. Um, yeah. And so that was a great example to just say, this is us being us. Yes. And I think that the success of that album is all of that. There's some good songs on that album. There's some songs that I frankly think are, are among the least inspired we ever did or least interesting to me, mm. my taste being what it is. Yeah. But that said, the process was spectacular. It was super cool. Um, the best moment of the entire thing was the first day getting drum sounds. And I had a kit and I had just gotten this new kit from Ludwig and I was setting it up and Levon came over and he said, he's looking at it and he goes, you know, I got a locker. <laughs> full of drums if you want anything and i, yeah, right. I said i said yeah yeah all right yeah, yeah. and as we're talking he looked over at one of the guys that worked with him and goes hey go grab that kit ringo gave me and i mean you know you're, one of my favorite drummers just suggested a drum kit that my favorite drummer gave him would be appropriate and i'm just <laughs> thinking yep yeah that's a good one and so this guy brought this kit over from the original all-star band tour in 89 wow. and and Paul Stacy, who was producing us at the time, and I were standing there, and we just looked at each other when he said that, like, yes. <laughs> and we we get this kit, and I set it up, and I'm trying, to, I'm tuning, and I'm trying to get some tones, and Paul's standing there listening, and you know the floor tom's a little dicey, but okay. And then uh, the kick drums, well, it's kind of rough. Rack tom. Finally, I'm like, man, I, these don't sound too good to me, you know. And Paul's looking at me like, oh shit. How do you tell Levon that his right. kit from Ringo isn't going to work, you know? <laughs> And uh, and the best part about it was after a minute, Levon came over and he goes, that does don't sound good at all, does it? And I yeah. said, I said, no, not really. And he said, I guess we need Ringo to play it. And he goes, hell, he'd make cardboard box sound good. And and I just stood there like, wow, OK, this yeah. is a good moment. You know, it's pretty good. Absolutely. Yeah, it was great. Please, please share any kind of memory you have. You just played with Ringo uh, recently and, yeah. And, yeah. and Greg Bissonnette um, as well. I, I was... Um, yeah, I was up in Philly for a day and they were there, uh, you know, I just luck of the timing. I happened to be in town and I'd seen them in Nashville the week before. I'd just been down and seen them and my son and I went here, but I was up in Philly and uh, and I, I guess I can tell this story as we were at, at the Ryman show uh, here in Nashville. I we we spent a few minutes with Ringo right before the set. We got down there late and it was fine. Just had five or six minutes chatting and catching up. And as they were walking to the stage, he said, all right, well, you know, because they when he finishes the set, he's out the door in a car gone. He doesn't hang out the venue. Yeah. So he says goodbye before the show starts, because you're not going to see him after. So he said, OK, well, good to see a brother. Take care. You know, the whole thing. And as he's walking literally to the stage over his shoulder, he looked back and said something about yeah, but, 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 just follow Greg. And I said, you know, or he, said, no, he said, keep your eye on Greg. That's all I heard. And I said. I never turned my back on Greg. I don't trust him at all. You know, like I thought it was just banter yeah. and everybody laughed and then off they went. And so I watched the show and had a great time. And then I got up the next day and I, and Bissonette called and he goes, dude, where were you? And I said, where was, what do you mean? And he goes, where were you on little help for my friends? Ringo said, jump up on the last song, wow. which they haven't been asking people to do that for a few years. I know that they, the, it's just, and I, I mean, I literally got physically ill because I said, I, I didn't hear him say that, you know, and he said, yeah. So, so I spent a whole day just dying that Ringo had asked me to sit in and I blew it off. Oh, I didn't man. hear it. You know, I'm like, how do you snub Ringo star, you know? And I was just crushed. Yeah. And so I had a meeting scheduled for the next week. I was going to go to New York for a day. The guy called me the following day after all this had happened. You know, I found out I'd fucked up on a Friday yeah. and on Saturday, this guy called and said, Hey, 
instead of coming to New York, I actually got to be in Philly next Wednesday. Can we just meet there? And I said, it's for radio. I said, it's all the same to me. I don't care. I'm just coming where you are. And so I was going to go to Philly and I, my buddy's the pro, uh, promoter up there. And I texted him. I said, Hey, I'm in town next Wednesday. You got any gigs? And he wrote right back Ringo. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> and so I was happy. I thought, well, I'm going to see the show again. And at least I can say, I'm sorry, man, I didn't hear you, you know? <laughs> and so that night I got there and right away they were like, okay, you can make it, you know, get up tonight and right. do it. So I was like, Oh my God, thanks. Yeah. But I went, I was talking to Ringo before the show in Philly and he said, and he looked right at me. He goes, "You're not going to snub me again, now, are you?" You know, and I'm like, "Oh my god." He goes, "Unless you're too big of a radio star to remember how to play drum." You know, and I'm like, I'm sitting there going, "Man, Ringo's busting my balls. This is the highlight of my life." You know, it was fantastic. So then he said, "Yeah, get up and play a little help for my friends." Awesome. And he said, "Okay, so just he goes, you know, come the photograph was in the encore, is not the encore, but towards the end of the set. And he says, "Okay, so be on stage left when we play photograph." And I was like, I can do that. And he goes, you, you know, photograph, right? And I'm, I said, yeah, it's the first 45 I ever bought with my own money. I kind of remember that one. And, uh, you know, it was it was fantastic. I was I was having an anxiety attack while they were playing photograph. I'm standing there going, oh, my God, this is about to happen. I'm going to get on stage with Ringo. When I got to the kid, I was fine. But the buildup sure. just was crazy. Right. But, yeah, it was a blast. It was it was the. I think that's probably the happiest five minutes sitting at a drum kit I've ever had in my life. Cause I was just watching him do his thing. And I was like, this is, this is fantastic. There's never been one moment of my life that I remember where this wouldn't blow my mind. Right. You know, right. incredible. Thank God for second chances with Ringo. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a, that was a lucky break. That is amazing. One more question. Michael Howes asking, do you follow PGA tour or play golf at all? I used to play golf a ton. Um, I picked up golf uh, on the Shake Your Moneymaker Tour at the time. That was a, uh, you know, at, at, at that time I was like, where can I go for six hours that I won't see anybody in the band? <laughs> and, I, and I was like, well, I can go find my own hole in the wall bar every day or I can take up golf, you know. There you go. Kind of do both, actually. Right. I can drink a case of beer and do something else <laughs> outside. So I started playing. Actually, our T-shirt, our merchandiser, Weggs, was a big golfer. So I started going with him, and and I, I loved it. I played throughout the 90s all the time. And I I immediately, very quickly got to where I was a bogey golfer. Like, I could break 90, and I never broke 80. Didn't care. It was the perfect amount of, I enjoy, you know, I'm competing with myself. And if I, you know, I'd just go out and shoot a 96, I'd be mad. But, but mostly I was like bogey minus a couple strokes here and there. So I was always a mid to high 80s guy. And that was more than enough for me. I just enjoyed it. And I've played all over the place. I mean, I, I mean, the good thing about being on the road is the promoter, you give them a couple days notice, he'll always find some top shelf course to, for you to go play around on. So, you know, I've played in, um, you know, I've played in a few different countries. You know, I've played in Japan and Australia, New Zealand and Denmark and, and uh, I've never played in the United Kingdom anywhere, for some, which is an odd thing. But, um, you know, played a lot of a lot of golf at a lot of places. I never joined a club or I, I just play public courses at home. You know, I'm not going to I don't love it so much that it's worth, you know, joining like a golf club for. But at the same time. But then but then, you know, once you have kids, I had a long period of time. It's kind of tough to come home from a six month tour and then go, hey, babe, I'm going to go play golf for eight hours. and. Right. We have a baby and a toddler here. It just it just fell away. Yeah. Um, the good news is, is my son, who's now 19, a few years ago, he got into golf. So then we started playing. Sure. I really just play with him now. I, I don't I don't play very often. I really enjoy it. But truthfully, I just I don't have time. Sure. And does he have any musical or drumming aspirations, your son? He doesn't have any aspirations. He's got plenty of ability. He's a good drummer. Okay. Um, and he and he picked up guitar for a year, like in fourth grade, and then just dropped it. And he was a, he played sports in school, and uh, he listens to music constantly. Okay. And I think I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he pops in from college one day and happens to say, "Oh, by the way, I'm in a band." But right. you know, <laughs> I I've, I'm never I've never pressed e both my kids. I have a 17 year old daughter as well. They love music. They go see shows. She goes to see shows all the time. I mean, it's a really big part of who she is. Um, and uh, she just started playing bass this year, and she's she's pretty good at it. I mean, it's kind of awesome. weird, like, oh boy, all right, you know. Hey, but yeah. uh, but but I I never wanted to steer them into playing music or even what they listen to. You know, it's important that they find their own music to love. You know, it's I 
I always felt kind of like a jerk saying, let me explain this third Wilco album. You know, the reason it's so special. And they're just looking at me like, Dad, I don't care. I didn't. <laughs> right. I only do that a few times before I realize I'm just talking to the wall. Right. What did they think about your music in the Black Crows? Oh, they loved it. I mean, they, you know, they grew up. That's just what they knew. Yeah. You know, when the when I told them the band was over, they were devastated. I mean, it was a really sad thing, you know, like, wow, sorry. <laughs> you know, right. And it's and it's not that they were fans. It's just all they knew. Like, it's right. just, you know, you're talking about at that time they were, uh, you know, they were 13 and 11, I guess. And it's just the, just like, wait, wait, what are you saying? You know, it's like saying, you know, it's it's just every they just didn't even they just didn't know that that meant everything was still going to be OK. That's like, well, well, what now? What do you mean? What's what's happening? It was it was very scary for them to hear that and very sad for them because they love going to the shows. Sure. I mean, they grew up going to gigs all the time. You know, it's right. what they, it's what that's normal to them. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of us were sad, Steve, uh, you know, when we heard that the Crows uh, were breaking up and no more. Thankfully, we still have the music. We still have all the albums. Lastly, what haven't... There's we... about 2,000 gigs out there, too, by the way. Right, you guys <laughs> recorded like, You guys recorded People are always like, man, well, don't you miss those live shows? I'm like, man, there's... go there. You, you can... You'll never get through all of them. They're That's all right. out there. Go enjoy them. We left behind plenty of gigs. Man, absolutely. All, all kinds of live stuff. What haven't we covered, if anything, about the book, Trigger Hippie, the show? What, what do you want to end the show by saying, Steve? Um... Well, you know, I don't know. I really, I, I, I in, in terms of the book, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I mean, I'm kind of blown away by the response and really appreciative. Um, I, I, there's a sense and a level of vulnerability involved in putting this out that goes way beyond putting out an album. <laughs> you know I mean? It's like, you know, people could say, oh, I like that song, but I don't like that. You know, this is a very different level of exposure, if you will. Um, so that was, I had moments along the way where I would think, oh, uh, you know, but it's just been great. Um, and, and now that it's out, I, it's like, it, it, again, like waiting for the Ringo thing. The buildup is what was killing me. The second it's like, OK, it's there. Anybody can go get it. Anybody can read it. Anybody can you can say what you want about it. It's 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 real. It's authentic. And that's all I was looking for. Um, you know, but I, I hope um, I hope people that get it see two things that, that, you know, there's a lot of humor in it to me. Um, um, and my, my looking at the absurdity of situations is in no way. I mean, I look at every band in a certain sense of revere the music and, and don't take the rest of it too seriously. You know, um, one of the things that was, was, was a fatal flaw in our band was, it was always just too precious. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's not that precious. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot stronger, you don't have to coddle it and squeeze it and choke the life out of it. Let the thing be. It is what it is. And, um, you know, so writing about that was uh, was it, I, I hope that comes across in the book. You know what I mean? And and also what I hope people understand is. And, and, and this is a tired trope and it's trite and it's a thing people say a lot without thinking about it. I've put a lot of thought into this is how much I'm forever appreciative of all the people that did support the band. That is. I, trust me, I. I cancel more gigs than I go to now because it's hard to just get yourself out at 730 at night. You know, I got you got other things going on. You got a sick kid. You got a sick dog. You got whatever. And for the people that came to see the band over and over and over again, I I I was aware of it in real time. I'm more aware of it now. It's an amazing, amazing opportunity that those fans have provided for us. And I'm and I'm forever grateful for that. Well, and I'm grateful for you, Steve, and your music. Uh, The band is amazing stuff. Thank you for doing all you're doing. The book is called Hard to Handle the Life and Death of the Black Crows. Thank you so much, Steve Gorman, for being on the record today. Right on. Thanks, man. 